Dr. Joel Foreman is an associate professor of pediatrics and community and preventive medicine at Mount Sinai. In addition, he serves as pediatric residency program director and vice chair for education. He also serves on the New York City Board of Health. Dr. Foreman is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Environmental Health and a member of the Centers for Disease Control Led in Pregnancy Workshop. In 1999, together with his colleague, Dr. Philip Landrigan, Joel worked to create a pediatric environmental health specialty unit at Mount Sinai. It receives core support from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry of the CDC and the United States EPA. Mount Sinai Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit is a member of a national and international network. Pediatric environmental health specialty units are located across the United States, as well as Canada, Mexico, Argentina, and Europe. Dr. Foreman's specialty is in exploring the health impacts of substances found and created in our environment. He has lectured widely on synthetic turf. We are fortunate and deeply grateful and honored to have him here today to share his expertise. And before I ask him to take the mic, one last thing, make sure your cell phones are off. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Foreman. Uh, thank you. Um, good reminder, just turn mine on silent too. <laughs> um, just a little update on that. So I, I am a current member of the New York City Board of Health. Um, I am a member of what's called the AAP's Council on Environmental Health and a past member of the Executive Committee and of the CDC work group on lead because the work group finished its work and about two years ago published our uh, guidance on exposure to lead in pregnancy. So that's actually done. Um, still pretty active in the Council for the AAP and may someday be part of the Executive Council again. Uh, which would be nice, executive committee again. So um, thank you for inviting me. I have a very uh, warm feeling for Hastings. Um, from a long time ago, my, any of you may have known my aunt, Mary Kaufman, um, lived here on 210 Ballard Street and passed away a few months ago this year um, uh, at the age of 85. So I've been here in Hastings many times um, and also had some friends who lived here not so many years ago. So um, I feel connected to this community. So it's nice to be able to help out as best I can. So. Um, I have no <laughs> disclosures. I have no commercial relationships with any producers of anything. Uh, I just work for Mount Sinai. Um, I, I do like to thank, you know, I got involved in this back in, I think it was 2006 initially, um, and then have updated and the talk and spoken about and updated my knowledge on synthetic turf several times since in 2007, 2009, 2011. Um, but even from the very beginning, Megan Bullock, who's now in medical school up in Boston, uh, Maida Galvez, who's a colleague at Sinai, and Perry Sheffield, who's a colleague at Sinai, both of whom are now faculty, were very instrumental in helping gather information initially when I knew absolutely nothing back then about synthetic turf. So I'll do my best to try to educate you. I'm not a chemist, and some of this stuff is sort of complicated. So, just for those of you who don't know, so synthetic turf's been around for a long time, and it was um, initially an interest of the Ford Foundation, and the whole idea was to improve physical fitness, and you know, so the whole focus initially was to provide more accessible um, fields that were more durable, would be around longer, and more access, you know, more time available for physical fitness. So that was the driving force initially, and people probably remember the Astrodome and the first synthetic turfs. So those came out in the 1960s. Um, actually, I'm from Providence, Rhode Island. It turns out one of the first installations was at Moses Brown, which is a private school very near where I grew up. Um, and then, of course, the Houston Astrodome was one of the first professional fields, probably the first, to get this um, synthetic turf that was a carpet-like um, and was then called from thereafter AstroTurf. And I'll show you what that is. It's very different from what's used now, which people call third generation. I'm not quite sure what the second was. Um, but um, the current generation is very different in its construction. Um, I said second generation, but now I hear it referred to as third. So I think maybe the third is they're using alternative infills, which we'll talk about. Um, but, you know, I, I titled the talk sort of balancing health risks and benefits, and clearly I think communities struggle with this. And the reason communities struggle with it is that obesity is a big problem and that physical activity is one of the most important parts of solving that problem, amongst many others. And clearly, our country is really fat. Um, this is not a political chart. It has nothing to do with Democrats and Republicans. But, but red is not good on this chart. And you can see it go from uh, over a course of about 20 years. That's the most recent one the CDC has out. It's a few years old. But um, you can see the percentage of people who are obese. And this is just adults. And there's similar tables for kids. But we have really gained weight since 1990. Um, and it's a problem. And so, all solutions need to be considered, I think, and this is one of the things that's being considered. 
So here's the original AstroTurf, and it was like a carpet. Anybody ever, there actually was one, my kids went to a camp not so many years ago at Asphalt Green, which is in the 89, 90s on the east side of Manhattan, and they, they've replaced that field, but when they went there, they're now 14, 16, when they were little, they had an old AstroTurf surface. Um, those surfaces are really slippery when they get wet, almost unusable when they get wet if they don't have good drainage. And you all remember, you know, turf toe and uh, friction burns that were very common on these. It was a very different kind of surface. It was a little tiny pile. There was no infill. There was a padding underneath. Um, it wasn't all that great. Um, and there were lots of injuries and problems. And the football uh, NFL didn't like it either for a variety of reasons. This is sort of the newer version. Um, and whether you call it second or third generation, um, this is what it is. And it's much more complicated, and it's much better in many ways. Um, there's these little fake uh, grasses that are made of some sort of plastic, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's something added to it to keep them fluffed up and standing up. Um, and that's something that infill absorbs force um, and keeps the, the grasses up. Um, underneath, there's usually a drainage system, something that wasn't always so good in the past. Um, and then there's also this sort of rubber cushioning of some sort underneath that. So that's the design of sort of modern fields. And then they paint it. Um, you're going to have problems with the painting, too, which if you want an anecdote, I'll tell you about a small NFL mistake about how they painted the lines on a field once. So let's just touch briefly on what this stuff is made of. So the blades, or the fake grasses, are made of different things. They can be made of polyethylene, and they can be made of nylon. They used to use nylon a lot. And you may remember stuff in the news about lead on these fields. Probably. Probably the major source, although we don't know for sure, of lead was from the nylon grasses. They don't use nylon anymore for this reason. You might say, well, why would there be lead in nylon? It was put there, right? It helps fix the color, actually. That's why it's used. Um, you know, we've had problems with nylon of various sorts getting contaminated with lead, again, for this, used for the same reason. Um, uh, hoses can sometimes have it. We had Venetian blinds at one point, um, and it was the same thing. So that's it was an issue. There were several fields closed that had pretty high levels of lead, although I am not aware of any children who had elevated lead levels that were linked directly to these fields. It's hard to sort of prove, but certainly we wouldn't have kids crawling around on high lead surfaces. That's not a problem with the new blades. So that's out of it. Now they use polyethylene, which doesn't have lead in it, which is good. Um, and we know this was true. Actually, there were several uh, st uh, states, Department of Environmental Protection, and actually I think EPA too, who actually bought some <coughs> new samples and tested them and found lead in the blades. Then there's the infill. So I updated this picture a little bit just to teach you just a little bit about the stuff that keeps the blades standing up and absorbing force. Um, there's sort of two basic kind, three basic kinds that are out there now. Um, two of them are synthetic and one of them is um, natural. So the, the first that was used are different kinds of what they call vulcanized rubber, which means chopped up into little pieces. There's a whole science to that that I don't totally understand. Sometimes they chop them up mechanically. Sometimes they freeze it and shatter it. Um, there was a real interest in using tires, which is a huge problem for um, dumps, you know, where we put all these <laughs> tires. This was a way of using recycled tires. They're actually used in lots of things. Um, solid rubber cushioning underneath roads. There's all kinds of things can be done. But this was one use. Um, and so the styrene butadiene rubber often comes from recycled tires, but the problem, of course, with recycled tires is everything else that's on those tires after they've been used and all the stuff that's been added to them can get in there. There are ways of trying to remove some of that when they create the infill, but it's not perfect. You can use new rubber that's manufactured specifically for the purpose of infill, so you're not using recycled anything. And that's the EPDM as one type, ethylene, propylene, diene, monomer. Um, it's usually new rubber and it can serve the same purpose and then you don't have the problem of all the stuff that might have been in there with the recycled tires. One of the biggest issues with recycled tire infill is that when they did, there's a variety of people who have tested it, the state of Connecticut, New York State, EPA, and I'll come to some of that. Each batch was sort of different. It was very hard and you could imagine why it was hard to reliably know what was in each batch. And you're supposed to keep adding this stuff so it's not like you throw it on there and then you forget about it for a decade. It, it needs maintenance and new stuff. The next group, which is very popular with the NFL, is the TPE, or thermoplastic elastomers. And again, I'm not a chemist or an expert, but what I've learned is we know plastic is, all of these are made from synthetic carbon monomers, string, molecular string with a carbon backbone. Um, and the way it's produced in rubber is it's kind of like a piece of spaghetti round up and it's bouncy. Plastics, of course, like this cup, is hard, um, and so it has a rigid structure. TPE is sort of a combination of rubber and plastic. Um, and it's manufactured and can be manufactured in very specific shapes. So it has, you can create the shapes you want, but it's squishy like rubber. I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but it's the closest I can get, and it seems to make sense to me. The reason the NFL seems to like TPE 
is that it's great at absorbing force. And I actually was asked to talk to the NFL about this because their offices are in Manhattan about something separate, which I'll come to. But I stayed and learned more about the G-force stuff. Um, they're really interested in injuries, preventing injuries, head injuries, twisted knees, and um, you know, that's a big serious injury for the players to be out. And so this TPE stuff can be designed in a way that really does work and reduce injuries. Now we're talking about adults, professional players. It's sort of different than kids and everybody else. But um, there's some real advantages to that sort of infill for their purposes. It sort of comes back to it all depends on what the field's for, how you're using it, and what you're trading from and to. And then the final group is sort of um, natural products. You can use sand. You can use sand that's sort of a mixture coated with rubber. Um, and then there's products that use natural things like um, cork and coconut, apparently. Um, and there's a firm that, that markets that. And there's others. But So there's different stuff. It's all, but the basic structure is the same. You have um, the, the fake grasses, and then you need stuff to keep them standing up. And these are some of the choices of what you can use as the infill to keep it standing up. And again, the focus is usually on um, the best protection from injury. So I mentioned the infill, and these are the kinds of things that are in there. Um, most of them, are, I mentioned the types before. They're very small, about one millimeter. If you ever watch kids play on the field, you can see the clouds of dust. If you've had kids go to play on these fields, they come home with a little bit of a recycled tire infill kind of stuck to them everywhere. They get into all kinds of stuff. And if you measure it, you can find metals like lead, um, solvents, which is what VOCs are. Those are volatile organic compound solvents, um, PAHs, other contaminants. You can find lots of stuff. There have been some very interesting studies looking at what you can leach out, some peer-reviewed, some not. Um, if you use acid or um, more acidic solutions, you can get more stuff out. You can sometimes find some of these contaminants in the surrounding water, but not a lot seems to leach out according to most of the studies. Now, some of the stuff becomes vapor when you heat it, and that's a big issue. So it is potentially possible, although not proven, that you could get exposed. The only study I saw was in Europe that looked at um, sort of the volatiles in the air above at breathing level. And the only air time they found a problem was actually an in indoor. They can use this stuff in the indoor fields, too. And there, they actually had a little higher levels. Outdoors, again, because of outdoor air blowing everything away, they were not able to document substantially higher levels of volatiles. So I think, you know, when thinking about these sort of turf fields, it's really this big balance between, um, you know, the benefits of physical activity, um, how much you get to use the field, because we all know, those of us who live in New York, right, they close down the natural grass fields. You can't get on them after it rains heavily. They need, they need mowing. They need all kinds of stuff. So you are balancing. Um, there's questions about water. Obviously, you don't need to water in the same way synthetic fields, but you do need to keep them cool, and that requires misting, and that is water. Um, there's also this issue of um, what do you do with those recycled tires that, you know, we need uses to recycle things, so that's, I guess, a good thing. Um, and costs, um, which is controversial, and I'll tell you the little I know about it, and you'll have to figure out for yourselves what the real costs are and get different opinions. Um, on the downside, obviously, there's the potential for exposure, depending on what you choose for the infill. I think the issue of lead has been dealt with and is no longer an issue if you have the new polypropylene blades. Um, there's the issue of dispersing toxins into the environment. There was one Connecticut study that did show it had some effect on aquatic life. Um, there's the idea that these are hot and they're sort of heat islands when you have these synthetic fields out there, and we'll come back to that. There's questions about cost, and often, of course, whoever's selling you it likes to downplay the cost. Um, but there are larger costs. Sometimes you have to dispose of them. You have to maintain them. Um, it's always easy. It just every place I've gone, they're always issuing a bond to buy the stuff um, of some sort. They're taking a loan, right? Because you can get a loan to buy something physical, but you can't take a loan to pay people to do stuff on an ongoing basis. And that's usually the big problem for communities. Um, OK, so what are the potential benefits? I mentioned some of these. I won't belabor them. Um, you definitely do save some stuff, although it may not be relevant in New York State, but obviously you're not using uh, herbicides and pesticides on synthetic fields. Um, and some communities do. I talked in Chicago about this, and they would. In New York State, you actually can't on a playing field, so it's not actually an issue. Um, but you don't need those. And that, of course, those are petroleum products. So in the grand scheme of global climate change, you're using less petroleum products. You're not running the gas-powered mower that's mowing it, so that's a good thing. Um, there may be long lower long-term costs, or there may not, so there may be a cost advantage. Um, it looks pretty, um, and it is a use for recycled tires. Now, some of us, you may not think it looks pretty, but it depends on what you're changing from. Um, one of the fields I know very well in New York City, what they, what they traded was asphalt for synthetic turf in Chinatown. 
was probably a good choice, right? They were moving from high injury, very hot, terrible surface to something that was much, much better and really in a place where it would have been almost impossible to maintain natural turf. You don't face quite the same problems here in, in Hastings. So again, every community has to think of these things in different ways and there's probably a role for synthetic turf depending on where you are. On the downside, we mentioned exposure. So the biggest area of sort of individual exposures are to uh, stuff from recycled tires if you use that sort of infill. Um, many communities have moved away from that. New York City no longer uses recycled tire for new infill. Um, after there was New Yorkers for Parks and a lot of advocates pushed them to reconsider that. Um, and again, I think in New York City, they've also been a little bit more selective now going forward with where they install the fields, having to do with, you know, thinking about what's a very high impact field, like say soccer in a very densely populated area, or baseball, which is not so high impact on the grass, or recreational. Um, so th there are the potential direct exposure, and I'll mention in a minute how kids are exposed, but obviously you can breathe it in, you could, kids eat stuff. If you're gonna have little kids playing and they're crawling around in recycled rubber, they're gonna be getting some of it in their mouths. Um, and so there's all those different routes. Then there's, uh, in terms of health effects, heat. That's probably the biggest and very well proven difference between synthetic fields and natural turf fields. They are really hot, They're much, much hotter, and I'll show you some of the data. I don't know if any, how many people here have actually been out on these fields on a hot summer day, right? Mm -hmm. I went to a, a wonderful flag rugby tournament not so many years ago with my daughter on Randall's Wards Island, which has lots of these fields on it now. It was very interesting. The one, it was a sunny, hot day, and in the sunny parts, it's, it's sort of hard to be out there. In the shade of the Trevor Bridge, it was okay on the fields that were in the shadow. But once you crossed over, it was really markedly different. And every news agency that's gone out, um, and scientific um, uh, research has gone out and actually measured temperatures, reproduces this all the time. So that's really big. Other issues that people raise are injuries, particularly turf burns and bacterial infections like MRSA, the feared you know, resistant, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And I'll touch on that. Um, I actually think that's not such a big deal. I had to learn a lot about it. That's what the NFL was interested in. I'll come back to it. For you, this is my like one summary of what's pediatric environmental health for you. So for you all, you're probably talking about a field that might have multiple uses. Um, so if young kids are going to be out in the field, you have to think about their unique vulnerabilities. It's one thing for the NFL with adult professional players or high school or college, but if you're talking about a multi-use field with young kids, people lounging, sunbathing, um, animals, whatever, um, you have to be a little broader in the things you consider. So kids are, have unique um, vulnerabilities to exposure to environmental toxins. Um, and we see this repeated all the time, and we see it in the data that's available on exposures. You all know the CDC um, has this ongoing through the National Health and Nutrition Survey um, measurement of what we're all exposed to. And you can look it up on the website, and it's now a rolling report. It might be the fifth report on chemical exposures. Um, but if you look carefully at most of the exposures, you'll find the exposures in the youngest group, which is the 6 to 11 group, is often twice as high. The levels are twice as high for many things as in adults. And the reason why is that kids get more into their bodies. Um, they eat, drink, and breathe more relative to the size of their body than adults do. They have a faster breathing rate. They drink more water. They have a higher metabolic rate, so more stuff passes through them. Um, and they do things that we normally wouldn't do as adults, right? They put stuff in their mouth. Thus, the granules on the ground, kids, that's why kids get lead poisoning. My example is always to students. I say, if I took, covered this floor with 1,000 micrograms per square foot of lead, way, way above anybody's safe level, we would all come in here and meet every day and leave, and none of us would likely get any measurable exposure to lead. But if you held a nursery school class in the same room, you better believe they'd all get lead poisoned because they're on the floor and putting their hands in their mouth. So that's the, one of the major differences. We also know kids are um, developing um, rapidly and have unique what we call um, windows of vulnerability, particularly for brain and neurologic development. And we see this over and over, there are unique windows at which an exposure can cause real harm only at that time. And we've seen it with thalidomide and fetal alcohol syndrome, mercury, uh, methylmercury poisoning. So you know, we can tolerate a lot more and maybe a huge amount as adults, but if you get a young child or say fetal exposure, it's different. And we see this with pesticides and herbicides and all that. So you have to keep that in mind when you're, when you're thinking about who's being exposed. And then finally, to quote Phil Landrigan, kids have a very long shelf life. So, which means that if there's a long latency, if you're talking about, say, something like um, cancer or a chronic lung disease from an exposure to, say, arsenic, because there is an association, say, between arsenic um, and lung disease, you're talking 20, 30, 40 years between exposure and disease. So for someone who's 50, like me, you know, other things are likely to get me first. Um, you know, 
uh, atherosclerotic disease, for instance, um, before if I'm exposed today. But kids hopefully have 70 or 80 years ahead of them when they're young, and so they have a greater chance of developing those problems over time. Okay, so what sort of studies are out there? And I'll just, these are just a few. There's not a lot recently. I'll show you some. Around 2010-ish, sort of most of them are done. There's not a lot of new data on exposures, but um, Rutgers did some interesting stuff in 2006 looking for leaching and found some leaching, as I mentioned, of um, some of the chemicals found. This is recycled rubber infill. Um, EHHI, which is an advocate sort of group in Connecticut in 2007, looked at PAHs um, and whether or not at very high temperatures, 60 degrees Celsius is quite high, there was, vault, you know, got into the air, so it could be breathed in. And they also looked at if you wash through the stuff with distilled water. 60 degrees Celsius and 98. Your normal body temperature is 37. That's 98.6. 60 is really hot. Okay. <laughs> I'd have to, I could calculate it if I took a minute out. I mean, it's like 150 degrees. It's like really hot. Okay. Um, right, yeah. I took, it, Fahrenheit. So 30, so th what it means is that it may not be so relevant to the sort of temperatures we experience. Although I'll show you, maybe not. I'd have to convert. I can tell you your normal, 98.6 is 37 Celsius, if that gives you. 140, 140. I was close. Thank you. It was close. It's pretty hot. But I'll show you temperatures on these fields get hot. Um, they also did some studies of leachate. In other words, they ran water through it to see what would come out. And they were able to detect some metals and things from the, probably from the recycled tire infill. Again, what we found is that those infills varied a lot, different batches of recycled tires, so you never quite knew what you were getting. Um, and obviously, if you made the water more acidic, you got more stuff out. And then we have acid rain, and you know, water's pH varies, so it's possible. So there's the concern about exposure to toxins, which again, I think since you're probably no longer considering recycled tires, a lot of those are not as much in the, in the um, mix anymore. There are new, obviously there's new synthetic rubber products, which may have some, but it's not the long list. There's not metals. There's not all this other stuff that we know and are as worried about. And the worry, obviously, from those exposures, if you look at health effects of long-term exposure, includes things like neurocognitive development, maybe cancers, all kinds of stuff. Um, none of it proven with this low-level exposure, but all of it a concern. And as we learn more about low-level exposures, we certainly find more and more instances where they do directly affect, say, neurodevelopment. Heat is a really big one, and I'll come back to that in a minute because I have some information on the temperatures, but they're really high. And then I just want to move to the idea of turf burns. So there's been lots and lots of, well, not lots and lots, but quite a number of very well-documented clusters of MRSA infections in players of various ages um, related to turf burns, which are, you know, friction burns. And it is true, depending on what study you look at, there may be slightly more friction burns on synthetic fields than on grass fields, although you see them on both. Some of these have been reported by the CDC, and you see that the LA Rams in 2005 had this problem and was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, thus the NFL's big interest in turf. Um, just so you, if you're interested, what the NFL's question to me was, they were being marketed a special antibacterial spray of some sort that would have to be applied every week to all of their fields that are synthetic, and I think they're almost all synthetic. Um, and their question was, do we need this? Uh, is it safe? But we don't know because they don't tell you what the stuff is they're putting on to kill the MRSA, supposedly. And is it necessary? And the answer actually was very easy. The answer is it's not necessary um, because actually the MRSA doesn't live in the field, certainly not outdoor fields, and that's been studied. It's not like the, the killer bug is living in the field. It's on us all, all the time. It's when you break the skin, it can get into you. So you have to properly care for it. In every single cluster, the problem isn't the problem is that the injuries aren't cared for. It's that they have MRSA in their whirlpools that they're sharing or creams or towels. or It's all hygiene in the locker room. And very simple steps have always stopped the, the outbreaks with simple hygiene. So it's not that MRSA lives in the field, but some companies took advantage of that and tried to market very expensive stuff to the NFL. And they asked us for our formal opinion. We gave it to them, and they didn't buy it, which is good. OK. Injuries. Um, there's, there is a little bit of new data on this, but basically, it's not definitive. Overall, uh, field turf is one of the big producers, um, and geoturf is another of these different systems. Um, the absolute injury rate is very similar for athletes, um, but the type of injuries may vary. Um, there were slightly, in this study, which is an interesting one published in 2004, and I haven't seen anything really better, it's in the Sports Medicine Journal, there was slightly higher in incidence of what are called zero ti day timeout, so sort of those are the, the turf burns, the not so serious injuries with artificial surfaces. 
Um, and they were slightly higher on natural turf, more serious injuries. Again, it depends on, and there's other studies that may conflict with that. Um, I think good coaching and good maintenance are probably more important than anything else. And maintenance is important for both natural fields and synthetic fields. Okay, temperature. These are some that are often quoted. Uh, you can look at the temperature, synthetic surface, synthetic turf surface temperature of 173 degrees on a 98 degree day. And you might say, well, we don't have that many days like that. We have a lot of over 90 degree days even here. And for some communities in this country, if you go to the Southwest um, or the South, they have a lot of really hot days. And so these are all important considerations. Um, natural grass on the same day is much, much cooler. And even the head level, sort of breathing air temperature, was 138 degrees over the synthetic turf field in the study at the University of Missouri. And they did a pretty good job. BYU did another similar study. Again, artificial turf had a much higher average than natural grass on relatively warm but not super hot days. And every study you show shows this as a problem. And I, just, I would just say go out and, on a hot day and go to these fields. And you'll, the heat is an issue. OK, what about the leaching out? I want to keep track of the time, so I leave you time for questions. EPA did a study in 2009, a scoping study, where they went to look for all kinds of things, particulate from the dust when people run on it. So that's PM10 is just dust in the air. Think of it that way. Um, and they found at some playground sites with high activity, lots of kids running around, they found elevated PM10 levels, but they said they were lower than the Clean Air Act standards. NAAQS is the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. That's an interest, that's how a lot of these government reports go. They'll measure levels, so they'll use a government standard, and they say, well, they're below the standard, therefore, that's not a problem. And I would challenge that. I just would challenge you to think about that a little bit. Because government standards are not health-based in most cases. They are a compromise between what can be done, costs, political considerations. And a really good example of this is, um, you all remember the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. There's some wonderful studies published um, in JAMA about this. And what they did for those Olympics is they wanted to make sure that contestants and spectators could move around downtown Atlanta really easily. So they needed to get rid of traffic. So what they did is they um, put in lots of traffic controls, flex work hours, and they were very successful in making it easy to get around. And they measured traffic counts and air pollution levels and they all went down by 20, 30, 40 percent during the Olympics and went back up afterwards. And they studied it by looking at the most obvious connection to air pollution, respiratory disease, and kids say asthma. And they did a very nice job of looking at hospitals, doctors' offices, healthcare networks, high payer, low payer. And they found a 40 percent drop in asthma claims during the period of the Olympics that shot right back up as soon as they lifted the controls. And no other medical problems changed at all during that period. They didn't go down because, like, say, maybe you couldn't get to the hospital because of security or et cetera. Everything else was flat, big drop in respiratory stuff. Very interesting. The reason I'm mentioning it is that at no point did any of the air pollution levels exceed the national ambient air quality standards before, during, or after the Olympics. They were all, the highest was like 70% of. So to think that a level that's in a Clean Air Act or some EPA level is a sort of bright line below which there's no effect is just plain wrong. Now, I don't know that the levels they measured really were harmful, but Pretty much the evidence we have is that the lower you reduce air pollution levels or particulates, the better you are. The lower you reduce um, chemical exposures, the better. Once upon a time, a lead level of 70 was considered OK. Now a lead level of 5 is considered not OK. This is good evidence that there's subtle impacts. So a lot of the, the studies like the EPA one and even the Connecticut one and the New York State one tend to rely on whatever the current standard is and say if it's below that, it's OK. We don't necessarily know, but there's some good evidence that those, standard, those standards are not health-based. So just keep that in mind. Um, and this is the Connecticut one in 2010. Again, the most interesting bit was the runoff of zinc. Again, this was recycled tire infill. And there was some implication that there was an impact on aquatic life. I mentioned this before. Um, and their conclusion was there's some potential um, for runoff. Now, I would say this probably varies with the weather. A few days ago, we had some pretty heavy rains, right? And then, of course, the alert comes out because they were dumping raw sewage all around New York City. You shouldn't be swimming or boating immediately after, which happens every time there's a heavy rain in New York City, because they get more than an inch an hour. It over, it's too much for our, um, our processing plants, and they dump raw sewage every single time. Um, you could imagine in very heavy rains, there'll be more leachate. So it's, the experimental conditions of these studies are limited and don't necessarily apply to all conditions. This is. Um, the, the New York State DEC study in 2009, they also found zinc potentially as a runoff. They didn't, uh, an outdoor fields 
find elevated levels of solvents in the air. Um, again, the particulate matter data was interesting, and they actually said they couldn't tell. <laughs> because of wind and other things they tried to do, they weren't able to reliably decide if the dust in the air was really increased with playing. Um, they did confirm, again, so this is New York State DEC, that temperatures were much higher, 35 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than natural turf at the same time. So I think those are interesting. Um, the AAP, the Academy of Pediatrics, has some standards above which um, they use a wet bulb temperature, which has to do with humidity and temperature together, um, where the risk of um, heat exhaustion or heat stroke rises. And a lot of the time, on these hot fields, it gets above that level, and you have to be cautious. So it does become an issue. And when you think about accessibility, it might be great that you know it's available right after the rain, and the natural turf field wouldn't be. But if it's really hot, for those hot days, it may not be as accessible as you would like it to be. Again, I don't know all the data, how many hot days you have in Hastings, and rain, and all that. So those are all things to consider. But I think they're all reasonable considerations. California did a similar study. I think I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's very similar. They also looked at um, injuries again, and they found maybe higher abrasions, but um, other studies, again, showed maybe less, more serious injuries like head injuries and twisted knees and things like that. Again, the California study found surface temperatures 16 to 39 degrees higher than natural turf at the same time. So that one comes up and up. There's been some newer um, concerns raised about recycled tires, black carbon, and unique carcinogenic effects. I'm not an expert in it. There are a few uh, PhD scientists researching this who are really concerned about black carbon. You also get it from diesel exhaust. Um, again, I think if you're not using recycled tire infill, you're probably not so worried about it. Um, but the health concerns related to black carbon include uh, cancer, neurodevelopmental impact on young kids, and actually blood pressure, interestingly, in adults. OK. Costs. So, this is really hard to figure out. <laughs> um, you know, you never know what you're going to get. Um, this is actually straight from the New York City Department of Health um, when they were early on. I forget. I can't even read my own thing. What year it was? I can't see it on the bottom. I can pull it out. It's several. It's a number of years ago. Thank you. I'm glad you can see it because my eyes are dying. But you'll see the difference in per year cost was about fourteen thousand dollars per year per soccer field. Now, again, what they included in that cost analysis may or not be. Um, correct, but even the way the city looked at it, it's not a huge, it's actually not that big a difference when you think about it. There's a lot more upfront costs almost always with these fields because you buy them, and there's lower ongoing maintenance costs in the sense of mowing and watering and things like that, but it's not actually true that these fields need no maintenance. I thought they did. When I first heard about them, I thought, well, you put them in, and you have them for 20, 30, 40 years. Well, first of all, the lifespan's only 8 to 10 years, most of the companies will tell you. So you're going to have to put a new one in in 10 years. Now, you have to ask the individual companies. They'll sell you whatever their thing is. But it, most of them say 8 to 10 years. Um, the seams come apart. If you go out to near, the place I see usually is Randall's Wards Island, because that's where I've been, um, the seams can come up. They need to be repaired and put back down, because it's like a carpet that's put together. Um, debris gets on it. You have to remove the sticks and all the other stuff that falls on it. Otherwise, you have trip hazards. That happens a lot if you have trees nearby. You're supposed to rake them, add new infill and rake them to keep it fluffy. Otherwise, you lose the cushioning effect. Uh, so there's ongoing maintenance that requires people to do it. Um, and you know it depends, again, on where you are and what sort of staff you have. But it's not as if it's zero maintenance. It is true you don't have to water them. But some of the schools like BYU and um, others have decided they have to miss them constantly on hot days so that they're tolerable for the athletes to play because they're too hot. So then you have to have misting and stuff and extra water stations and signage about that. So all of those things come into play, I think. Um, I don't know all the details of costs. Um, there, of course, are costs associated with um, natural turf fields, too. Um, but there's also a whole science around natural turf, which, I, again, having read a little bit about it, you know, specially bred strains of grasses for different conditions, whether it be humidity, temperature, climate, um, that do better or do worse in different places and are worth thinking about. Drainage is like number one. If anybody's followed the Great Lawn, you can go online and look at the beautiful stuff they did for the Great Lawn in. Um, Central Park, and actually right across from Mount Sinai, I think it's called the North Meadow, or the East Meadow maybe, um, they did a similar thing. That's a mostly recreational field, um, and they put natural grass in. It used to be, we used to call it the Dust Bowl because it was mud all the time. You couldn't keep grass there. The reason you couldn't keep grass there is because it had no drainage. So they installed a beautiful drainage system, and now it's great. They do limit access sometimes, but for the most part, it's beautiful. 
Um, again, I don't know the difference in cost, but they, there's a special bluegrass that's bred for this climate. And I think it's worth at least thinking about all of the different issues when you're doing costs. I do know that the fields that you know, were inadvertently contaminated with lead because they were using nylon fibers, there was then a large cost to remove and dispose of the lead, which is, of course, a hazardous substance. You can't just throw it in the dump. So those costs weren't planned on in advance, but the community was stuck with them afterwards. So you have to think about all of the costs involved, installation, maintenance, removal, and replacement over the lifespan of the field. The same is true. Natural turf fields, they'll often quote, you know, five years, actually, that you have to sort of reseed and sod. But a lot of that varies depending upon the drainage, the kind of grass, and the kind of maintenance. So costs are very complicated. And, uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think it's worth getting experts from all sides and probably multiple opinions about the costs to compare so you know. New Yorkers for Parks might be a good bunch to talk to because they have a lot of experience with this. Um, they also do a really neat report card on the status and the, of the fields. And if you look at their report card, which I think I brought it with me, but I didn't make a slide of it. Um, there's a lot of synthetic turf fields in New York City that are in bad shape. Um, they've done better in some areas, but a lot of them get poor grades because they're not getting the maintenance. They were able to get the money to install it, but they don't have the people in the parks department to maintain them. So there's lots of these costs, as I mentioned, not considered, which I just, I just mentioned to you. So alternatives. So I don't know a lot about these. I mentioned them in the beginning. Um, but there are alternative infills. And I think at least if you end up with a synthetic field, it's worth thinking of something other than um, recycled vulcanized tires. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, just for me, there's just so many unknowns with that. Um, and some studies that show potential exposures to metals and solvents that it doesn't make a lot of sense um, on face value. It's a hard thing. But there are certainly other both synthetic and natural alternatives. And if you end up with a synthetic field, it's probably worth really figuring those out. And I mentioned these before, rubber-coated sand, the cork and coconut husk, the thermoplastic elastomer, which, again, that's what the NFL uses. And for their purposes, they're probably making a great choice, right? Consistent conditions, great absorption of force, reduced injuries. They can afford to maintain it every single week. Um, and it's adults out there. The, the sort of funny side story is we had an emergency call from them. They used a paint. You, you all may know that lead is really good at fixing bright colors. That's why people used to use it in ceramics, imported ceramics. It's also good for paint. Um, it's good for outdoor paint. And um, somebody tested, and they had painted lines on their synthetic field with an extremely high lead-based paint. And the levels were astronomic in one field, which I will not mention what team. Um, <laughs> We told them that one game on it for adults is unlikely to expose those adults, and there are no kids playing on it. And they, of course, removed it and cleaned it and put on new lead-free paint afterwards. But, um, and then, of course, there's a natural grass system. Um, I mentioned before, drainage is really big. If I don't know the physical environment of the field that you're, you're thinking about. But um, improving the drainage system is really important if you do do a natural grass system. And there are plenty of. Um, uh, well-proven methods for doing that that use perforated pipes and pea gravel and all kinds of stuff that were used at um, uh, places like the East Meadow and, and um, Central Park and the Great Meadow and stuff like that. And then again, I'm, as I mentioned, special grass seeds that have been developed specifically for this. Um, there's a really big increase in this. When I was reading a little bit about it, since the mid-90s, there's been this explosion in the science of different types of grasses. That I'm not an expert in. You'll have to bring in a grass expert and a, and a natural turf expert. But there certainly are people who know about it. And it's probably worth looking at. Um, and then there's also sort of the issue of the environment, sort of the natural versus synthetic environment. And to many people, especially if it's a multi-use space, do, do you really, is it really, how attractive is it to lie out on a synthetic turf field in the hot sun sunbathing as opposed to natural grass? And kids need exposure to nature. And this is definitely not a natural environment when it's all plastic and rubber. So, those are all considerations that are, I think, reasonable for any community to consider. And it comes back to the big issues of what is the field being used for and who's using it. And again, that varies. And I'm not an expert in Hastings in this field. But it, for the little um, small soccer field installed in Chinatown, I think they probably, personally, again, just me, it seems like they made a great choice. They went from a terrible asphalt surface to a very highly used synthetic surface that is probably on net really beneficial. If it's a total recreational um, field, like the one across from our hospital, I would have been really shocked and disappointed if they put in synthetic turf there, because it's mostly recreational news and people sunbathing and kids, kids coming from the local schools who use the park out there playing, you know, set up their cones and playing games during the day. That, you know, I was very pleased they chose to use good drainage in a natural turf system. Um, for a professional football team, Maybe they're making the right choices using TPE and, um, you know, uh, as an infill and, and synthetic turf. So it's, 
I think very dependent upon what the community's needs are and who's gonna be out there using it. Um, I do think heat is a pretty big and very well established problem with these synthetic fields and you have to be very careful. Think about what the shade is, how it might limit access itself and what the risks might be to young kids particularly with very high temperatures. Um, the abrasions, as I mentioned before, may be more common, but it's not that the, the killer staff lives in the field, particularly outdoor ones. There's very good evidence that's not true. It's all about hygiene and taking care of abrasions that happen at any time, and we all should just be careful about that. Um, you know, the biggest issues are for teams who share equipment. I've seen everything from the towels and the whirlpools and the creams to the stuff that the tensors wear, where the, actually the, you know, the uniforms that they sometimes share, the little monitors that, that score, that's where the MRSA was living. So, you know, it can be everywhere. It's all about hygiene. Um, and then the, recy the recycled tire infill probably carries additional risks and lots of unknowns, which is now definitely avoidable in almost every circumstance if you choose not to do that. Um, I think there's some increased costs. Probably the cheapest product is recycled tires but um, it's very hard to ensure, to know what's in it and to have each batch be consistent. Um, there are some new issues with recycled tires like the black carbon, I think, that are important. Um, and again, you can avoid those. I mentioned the cost considerations and that's very complicated, but I, I um, really hope that you take the time to think about those and get experts to talk about those costs. Um, if you do use synthetic turf fields, you've gotta make sure that you are prepared for the very well-known issues, particularly heat, and the potential take-home exposure. So they're not really probably the best place for young kids, infants, toddlers crawling around if you're using a recycled tire infill. You have to pay attention to friction burns and make sure they're clean, soap and water, and use antibiotics appropriately and not sharing creams if it's sports teams. Um, it's probably good not to bring stuff into your house, so shaking out the pellets from the socks and things like that if it's recycled um, tires. And the heat, um, signage, access to water, shade when possible, sometimes misting if it's going to be used on hot days for long, full sporting events for college or high school teams, I guess, um, are, are things you have to consider. And that sort of wraps up the big picture, and there's probably a lot more to talk about, so I'm happy to answer questions from cards or in person. Sure. Um, the first question is, you mentioned health risks with artificial turf. What are the health risks with dirt and grass and health risks for, for kids? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, you know, there's always the injury, which is the, you know, the biggest risk to kids is injury. So um, if you have poorly maintained grass fields, there are definitely, you know, with ruts that aren't, um, if it's not mowed, if it has hazards on it, if they have um, ruts and rocks and debris on it, absolutely those are risks. But I would argue that the debris and stuff is, as I've found in my own experience, a risk with synthetic fields too. Um, it's very hard to quantitate that. There aren't really great risks from kids eating the dirt. So in fact, one of the issues that often comes up is uh, lead in the soil, right? So if you have exposure to bare soil and lead. And actually the way to deal with that usually is to plant grass over it. <laughs> Uh, because it provides a barrier. Um, a lot of old houses that have had lead-based paint used on the outside for many, many years have been scraped a million times and it just falls in the dirt. And if you go and test the soil around your house, if you have a wood house that's been painted and it's old, I'll bet you you'll find elevated lead levels in the soil. Does that mean you have a problem with young kids? Only if they're playing and eating the bare soil. If you have grass and shrubbery and other stuff around, we generally don't see a problem. So um, again, a well-maintained natural turf field, I think, is as safe as any other sort of surface. Um, does that answer the question as best I can? Okay. Any toxic concerns regarding ecofill, coconut uh, or cork option? It's a great question. There's no research that I'm aware of on that. None. So we don't know. You are, it's an unknown. Um, it, you know, could it possibly be contaminated with, say, pesticides that were used, or is it organic cork or organic? I, we don't know any of that stuff. Um, I'm sure the companies can tell you about how it's produced. Uh, you have to know whether you can believe them, um, check their sources. Um, I don't know. It certainly sounds better than recycled tires to me. Um, but uh, I don't, you know, it's kind of interesting to use um, cork and coconut husks, but you know, we, we like the inside of the coconut. I guess this is a great use for all those husks that don't get used. Um, but th there's just no stat research on it, so it's hard to answer that question. Any difference in concussion risk between grass and turf? It's a great question, um, and the studies are a little conflicting, but to my reading of it, there's um, actually, um, with the studies that look at like real athletes, high school, college, and above, and this is why the NFL likes it, um, there seems to be better, more consistent 
g-force absorption with the synthetic turf fields, particularly with the thermoplastic plas plastic infill, which is designed, if you look online, you'll see beautiful pictures of the different shapes, can really be quite effective. Again, if it's properly maintained, you have enough infill, it's raked. Um, it looks like it offers an advantage for serious professional athletes. And if you ask most of them, they used to hate AstroTurf, but most of them like the professional athletes like playing on the synthetic fields. It provides great grip, consistent, uh, consistency doesn't get hard. Although it's interesting, you might say, what about when it's frozen? Is it, what's the, you know, they do study that, but I didn't see a lot of studies to show which is worse in like frozen conditions, natural turf or synthetic. But the professionals seem to, seem to have shown that there are potential advantages with the really great thermoplastic elastomer. I think it's also more expensive though. You have to see, I think that's one of the more expensive infills. Um, but, I mean, that's part of why they design it. And I think in the appropriate circumstances, that could be helpful. Is it a meaningful dis difference for young kids in recreational play? I doubt it. Not studied, though. That's just my personal opinion. I'd like your thought of its effects on injuries of knees and other joints with the usage of synthetic materials compared to natural ground. So that's a similar question. And I think the, the general, if you look at all of the studies, it looks as if um, more minor injuries like abrasions may be more common on synthetic and more significant injuries, um, knees and concussion, the things that as a, you know, multiple days out injuries seem to be um, higher on uh, natural grass for competitive sports. That's the best answer I have. This, it's not uniform. The data goes both ways. Depends on who does it, who does the research and what their own biases are. But um, I think on balance, um, that's how I would read it. Are turf burns as great on coconut? How about percentage of injuries? I think we did that one. And can you make any other distinctions between rubber infill and coconut? So the first one, um, are turf burns as great on coconut? There's not, I don't see a lot of research on that. The companies will tell you what they think is better about it. Um, but I don't, I don't know of any existing peer-reviewed research that compares the frequency of turf burns with different infills. Um, I would suspect they're not meaningfully different. One of the more interesting questions uh, is, is the heat issue different depending on what infill you use? I don't know if that question's coming up, but that's one of, because the heat is really a significant issue. Um, most of the studies I've seen show that it doesn't really matter what the infill is. The majority of the heat comes from the blades. You would think that the black recycled tire would be worse. Um, some of the companies will claim that the different infills reduce the heat substantially, but I haven't seen independent studies that confirm that. It may be that you could do better with the heat, but it's just not that well studied, and a lot of these are new, the new infills, so I don't know. Um, I do remember seeing one, though, that looked at um, like the, t the TPE versus um, uh, recycled tires and didn't find a significant difference. And clearly, no matter which way you go, the natural um, surfaces do much better and have lower temperatures. Would you support a synthetic turf field in your community with natural fill and where, where your child would play? Excellent question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, the answer really depends, you know, if you were asking me, um, again, just, again, not representing Sinai or anybody else, what would I think? It really depends upon the circumstances of the use of that. Again, I think that for my children who are now in high school, at high school, college level in athletics, would I support a synthetic turf field that's used for soccer or lacrosse or for them? Yeah, I, I, you know, that's my own, I think it probably offers safety things and it's well maintained. Would I wanna see, I think I sort of answered my talk about the different fields, uh, in a multi-use place where young kids are playing, when my kids were toddlers, with recycled tires, not really. Probably would be uncomfortable with that. Um, it's, again, it really depends on who's out there. The younger the kids, the more vulnerable they are to potential exposures. The more the balance of your, what you're weighing is about injury prevention and consistent field and performance of athletes, and you have older people, I think they have a role. But again, that's a personal opinion. I think every community has to make that decision based upon what your needs are. Maybe the whole thing doesn't have to be one kind of turf. Maybe you have natural a lot, and, but in the high, you know, soccer fields and football fields and lacrosse fields take a lot of abuse. It's much harder to maintain natural grass on those fields. Baseball fields are easier to do. Um, and um, you know, lawns and large open spaces that have multi uh, recreational use uh, are easier to maintain. So I don't know your field that well, but I think those are the questions I would ask and decide who's really using it and how is it used. Um, and 
so that's my answer about my own kids. It would depend on their age and what they were doing on it. Would you, in your opinion, vote yes or no on turf? Same answer. <laughs> <laughs> it would depend on my community and who was using it and what, what the purposes were. Again, my bias is, I think, for serious athletes, where the access to the field is really for serious athletes, it's used a lot for that, there potentially are some good advantages. Um, I, I wouldn't be that interested in recycled tires. But beyond that, um, I think actually for real athletes, the NFL sort of, you know, they, they think about this a lot. I was very impressed with how um, diligent they were. And of course, they're, as you know now, very concerned about concussions and head injuries has become a huge issue. They're really serious about studying these. They, they do not take the company's word at face value. They're doing independent research on impact absorption. They have money to spend, so cost is not really an issue for them. Um, so again, there might be some real advantages for seriously competitive uh, athletes on these fields. Would, have I ever played on turf? Yes, I have. Yep, because I was out there with my daughter at the mayor's annual rugby event several times, uh, which was on Randall's Wards Island, which has synthetic turf with recycled tire infill. And it was a very interesting experience, both with the heat and seeing the condition of those fields. Um, I actually saw another one in Long Island City the other day that was installed in an area which I wondered why they had done it that way. Um, it was being used a lot, but I also saw a lot of little kids and toddlers playing on it and rolling around on it. And that had recycled tire infill, I think. It must have been installed before they changed, because you could see it whenever they run, you see it, the dust clouds pop up. What about endocrine disruptors? Can athletes breathe in any plasticizers? That's a great question. What about endocrine disruptors from plastics leaching out of the surrounding? So with EPDM and infill, um, we don't really know, um, to be honest. Uh, I would argue that uh, our what we've learned about our exposure to plasticizers like, say, phthalates and BPA is that our diet is probably the single biggest source by far. And I think it would wash out any small amounts for older kids and adults inhaling any um, or hand-to-mouth. Now, very young kids with hand-to-mouth, maybe, um, but it's not been studied, I don't know. But really, you don't want to lose fact, sight of the fact that it's mostly in our diet and the cosmetics you use for phthalates, all of the soft soaps and makeup and all that stuff, all has phthalates in it, lots of it. Um, you suntan lotion, all that sort of stuff. Um, and in our diet, our exposure to um, BPA, where does that come from? It comes from the plastics and bottles we use. Now that'll go down now that BPA is being removed from just about everything. The danger of that is it's been replaced with something else to make this hard, and we don't know what that is. And when we find out 20 years from now, we'll probably not like that either. But um, so that's uh, it, it's an unanswered question. But I suspect that it's not the biggest, by far, the biggest source of exposure to endocrine disruptors. Are manufacturers offering the cork coconut fill as a real option? I think the answer to that is yes. I think absolutely is yes. I think GeoTurf is one of the companies that actually sells that and will, you know, they seem to be here to stay. I think that you wouldn't run out of the option of using it. And do these reduce the heat problem? Great question. Some mixed results. The companies often claim that it does, but I have to pull. There was at least one good study that showed that there wasn't a big difference between um, the TPE, as I said, and the recycled tire. I haven't seen direct studies about independent, uh, you know, without any conflict of interest studies about the cork and the um, coconut husk infill as opposed to, say, um, new uh, TPE infill versus recycled tires. It'd be nice to see all three of those. You could set up a little experiment in a little field and measure the temperature and measure the heat, but I don't think it's been done. It shouldn't be too hard to do, I think. Are you aware that New York State prohibits schools from holding practices <coughs> or games when the heat <coughs> index exceeds 96 degrees? <coughs> Excuse me. No. <laughs> but I think it's a great idea. Class. <laughs> I don't know what I got caught in my throat, but I'm fine. So I, I wasn't aware, but I think it's a great idea. I do think <clears throat> you have to think about the heat index and the wet bulb index for participation in sports, particularly for young kids who are at somewhat higher risk of. <clears throat> Heat stress, heat exhaustion, and um, heat stroke. <coughs> the next question says, LaManta, the manufacturer of GeoTurf infill with cork coconut husks, claims on their website that the field temperatures are slightly higher than grass and much lower than crumb rubber. 
Um, I have no independent, I know that's, a, I know that because I looked at their website, but there's no independent confirmation of that that I know of. Um, does it make sense? Maybe, it's still brown though. So if you're thinking about absorption of heat, um, you know, brown and black are both dark colors and have greater heat absorption, white has less. But I don't know of any independent studies that looked at the difference between um, the heat surface temperatures between those. But I do know that that company claims it. Are there particular concerns for kids with asthma? Potentially, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that, um, finally my throat clearing up, uh, that we do recommend is that people look at the air quality index um, when kids are going to participate in um, sports. So a lot of these sporting events, which I know is why we started sort of late in the afternoon, are usually after school, which as you know is the time of the highest levels of air pollutants on a daily cycle. Particulate matter is one of the, of the main uh, hazardous air pollutants that are commonly measured and that have the potential to exacerbate asthma. PM 2.5, which are the 2.5 micron and lower sizes, are inhaled deeply in the lungs and can certainly stimulate wheezing, very well known, as is ozone. Well, ozone is not a problem with these fields as far as I know, but particulate matter is, and you saw some of those studies, they looked at PM 10. I haven't seen a lot looking at PM 2.5. Um, but they looked at PM10, which is slightly, it includes 2.5, but it's 10 microns and less. Again, the levels were higher, but below the standard. Again, I would argue that we know that even below those standards, higher levels could stimulate asthma. On the other hand, I'm not aware of any clinical studies that show that there was a greater prevalence, or incidence rather, of um, asthma attacks among kids with asthma playing on synthetic fields as opposed to natural turf ones. It's a great idea to look at, but I don't think anyone studied it. Um, but there definitely is more particulates in the air. Most of them are the pellets, um, and some of it is at least the 10 micron size is elevated, but not at levels above the current standards for whatever that's worth. <coughs> what about syn turf and synthetic turf and insect life, microbial life, small mammals, birds, et cetera? Um, well, there's several questions. The first one is uh, not study, but clearly um, it's pretty dead in synthetic turf. Again, the studies that have been done have looked for bacteria that survive outdoors and there isn't much on these surfaces, which of course is in some ways good and in some ways it's not a natural environment, so that's true. Um, of course, you're not covering your whole environment, so that it's a small piece of the larger ecosystem and of course you have lots of woods around here and so I don't, you know, is it a big deal and will it affect other, um, you know, birds and animals? Probably not. Deer, well, that might not be a bad thing around here. Um, <coughs> That's an interesting question. What will deer do with these fields? You guys are infested with deer up here. I know that. Everybody's had Lyme disease, right? My aunt had Lyme disease. Everybody had Lyme disease. Um, I, yeah. They, are they out there? Yeah. They're on the field all the time. Interesting. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's a great question. Um, the definitely, again, it's not a living ecosystem on the synthetic surfaces, that's for sure. Have DNA studies been done of microbial life on synthetic turf versus grass? Not DNA studies, but culture studies, particularly for MRSA that found that the, they would actually go out and put the MRSA on the fields and then come back and test and see how quickly it died. Outdoor fields, it goes away very fast. Um, at two, five, and 10 years, no. No, no studies that I know of about, um, I don't think anything would live that long on those fields. Concern, how might this affect human, the human microbiome? I don't know. Um, I think not, again, most of <clears throat> our exposure is by what we eat. I don't think this would be a huge, have a huge influence on it at the scale that we're talking about. Cross dot, cross dot. Any information regarding track material used, rubber as it wears? So you mean like the track around the field? Um, a lot of that is made with recycled rubber products. Um, my understanding about those, I haven't looked in great detail, is there's still a heat issue, although they can alter the color. But um, I'm more familiar with the sort of rubber tiles used in children's playgrounds. Um, and there you have, you know, the kids come out there like black because the stuff gets all over them. Um, but the benefit of those rubber tiles was a dramatic improvement in injuries. There's no question that it, and it's much more reliable and, and does need much less maintenance than sand or um, wood chips or anything else that you would use. And so that, on balance, probably the benefit is huge. Um, I don't know really about the tracks, to be honest. Um, but then again, they're pretty limited area. If you think about it, you're running, you have shoes on, you're not playing in it, there's not small particles to ingest for young kids, probably less of a concern. Um, again, much, very durable, right? So, you know, runners do get a lot of issues, particularly knee and hip issues. 
and good absorptive surfaces, which you can clearly make with recycled rubber products and new rubber products, probably have a lot of health advantages for the people using the, the tracks. Oops. I was going to the next slide, but I didn't get there. Is synthetic turf repulsive to geese? <laughs> I wish. Geese and deer. You can, I have no idea. How long does artificial turf retain heat? I mean, how quickly does it cool? That's interesting. That wasn't in the studies. It was just sort of spot measurements on the high days. I mean, if the clouds come over, how quickly does it cool? I don't know. It's a good question. I think that's it for this deck. That is, and if you are willing, you are a I'm great willing. man. Here's the last few of them. Anyone else? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Does the coconut husk cork infill cause uh, fewer heat issues? Again, that was a similar question, and the answer is the companies claim so, but independent studies I don't believe have been done. Any research about chemical or toxic exposure from TPE or EPDM infill fields? No, actually. It was all about recycled uh, tire vulcanized rubber. Um, I don't know of independent studies that looked at these newer products. On the other hand, at least you know what's in it. Um, and they're, they're designed to not, they don't have all the surface contamination that tires do. But I'm not aware of studies that specifically look at it. Most of the studies around TPE are all about G-force and injury prevention. If outdoor temperatures routinely are 90 degrees and up, what is the synthetic turf temp? Um, as we saw, they can be 160, 170 degrees at the extreme if you get to the high 90s. Um, and certainly 130s, 140s on 90 to 95 degree days, without a, without a doubt. And that's been my own experience. I mean, I didn't have a thermometer, but it was hot. Uh, what are the safety limits in heat? Um, well, you mentioned the, the I, I have to go back and look, the wet bulb index or the heat index, which is similar, which again takes into account both temperature and humidity, um, usually is in the mid 90s where you start worrying about and wanting to limit activity. With now 90 degree days in May, <laughs> like we just had, what can we expect in the future? Well, climate change, more heat, I think, um, and more storms. Um, what does it mean in terms of um, the usability of synthetic fields, trade-offs, lost hot days, um, more early spring, late falls, is it more playable? And then the question about coconut and cork, and does that help with the heat? Again, <clears throat> same answer to the second question. That's a more philosophical question about global climate change and where we're going from here. Um, there have been a few studies that looked at, not terribly validated, that looked at sort of heat islands and whether or not, you know, if you did um, heat, you know, satellite imagery from above, you could determine whether it was really, you know, where, was it heating a whole community if you had a lot of these synthetic surfaces. Um, it wasn't clear what the answer is. It's probably not good for the overall heat, but um, I don't believe it's been studied very uh, rigorously. How many pro fields use synthetic fields? I think almost all of the NFL fields use synthetic fields. Um, that's the one I'm most familiar with because I was there. Almost everyone. It used to be Green Bay didn't, but I think they even converted. Um, they still like the snow and the ice. I know <laughs> New England does. I know the New York teams do. Um, use of water for cooling, yeah, they set, up, they set up misting systems so they can constantly mist the fields, absolutely. They don't have the slippery issue. The, again, the AstroTurf was just like being on ice when it was really wet. That's not true. These modern fields have great drainage and you don't get that tremendous slipperiness. Um, effect on soil below the field. As I mentioned, there are some studies, Connecticut uh, EPA, that showed some leaching of some metals like zinc um, uh, that might be harmful to um, the surrounding ecosystem, aquatic environment, things like that. Um, not entirely clear. Um, if you choose natural fill, like rubber or cork, you still have to replace them every, yes, yeah, it's, what wears out is you still have to replace the fields. The real replacement, I believe, is dictated by the carpet portion with the blades. You have to actually be putting infill in on a regular basis. You have to look at each manufacturer, but it's pretty frequent. You're supposed to add and fluff up the infill on a week, monthly basis or something, you have to check. Um, but it's not, it's not as if uh, you throw it on and you come back 10 years later and take it away definitely needs it. And it depends on the use, too, I would imagine. Again, if it's a very high-impact field, soccer, you probably need more attention. If it's a lesser-impact field, you probably need less. Yeah, what if the natural resource is depleted? I, I don't know that I, I, you get stuck with synthetic turf, another one. I think you, the problem is you have to replace the field. It's only going to be a decade solution, then you'll have to do another one. And it's a lot of money. You have to borrow. Everybody has to borrow to put these things in, right? They run in the millions of dollars to put in a new field. Is it possible that pellets wash out after heavy rain? They do, definitely. 
how much I don't, you know, relative to the amounts in it, but you definitely see it washing out. And they stick to the kids when they come home. Again, anybody's had kids play soccer on these fields, they come home with pellets stuck in their socks. Let's see. I saw one field, a warning sign that eating pumpkin seeds was not allowed. <laughs> I can't read all of it. To degree from all the trees we have as bad. Well, that's interesting. I don't know why pumpkin seeds in particular. I think it was to the point where you're restricted with what things you're allowed to bring on the field. Ah, I see. Um, well, it's not an organic field, so it's not going to, it doesn't have dirt, so I guess organic residue from people eating and stuff like that isn't necessarily going to decompose the way it would and get mashed into the dirt and grass. Um, but I do think that debris that accumulates on these fields has its own issues. It has to be removed and is a hazard. And that was my experience, again, just limbs and bits of trees and acorns and stuff. Those all need to be removed, otherwise you lose the, the good properties of the field and they become their own hazards for injury. Finally, great talk, thank you. <laughs> Middle school age, how would you rate the vulnerability? Um, more than teenagers, but far, far less than toddlers, you know, high, kindergarten toddlers and less. I think the greatest risk really is the, un, the under five crowd. The kids who are, you know, if you think about what we're, where are we worried about lead, we're worried about lead in kids up to about six years of age if their development may be normal. And the highest risk periods for kids with hand to mouth behavior is up to the age of about two to three. I mean, we ask these questions up to six in general peds, and, you know, we, but we routinely test at one and two. So once you get past that, it becomes much, uh, I think, less of an issue in terms of at least the hand-to-mouth exposure. Do studies take age into consideration? No, they don't, actually, usually do not. Um, the reference to s something in field. I can't read it. To Smith's? Oh, small children on the field. So no, they, they, often these studies don't think about the unique vulnerabilities of very young kids. Most of the studies are about uh, you know, teenagers and up or adults um, and what the impact would be. Anything else? Sure. Okay. I'm happy to chat afterwards. Th he just said he's happy to chat afterwards. Um, I cannot thank you enough. Your generosity and time is incredible that you went through all these cards and now is willing to stay and chat with us. Um, if I can invite you all to do that sort of in the, in the entryway, in the spare room, so we can put this room back together. Again, thank you all for coming. I came here thinking I'd have some questions answered, and now I have more questions. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Foreman. Sorry. No, that's perfect. Thank you.